Welcome to another episode of Inside with Outsiders. Today's special guest is one of our photographers. He is actually a New York-based wildlife photographer. Welcome, George McKenzie, everyone. Yeah, yeah, we love it. Yeah. Mind you, y'all know I don't drink. Those who know me, I might take a little mezcal here and there, okay. but I'm not a big drinker, so there's no alcohol infused in that. Welcome. What's well, up, Jeremy? Hey, hey, you know, I just gotta, I gotta let everyone know that we didn't plan this outfit. Oh no, we did not. Trust me, that's this is the first time we've had this problem on the show so far. I think this is the first time hey, guys, you and do I. Have... Do me one favor, just keep the banging on the table to a minimum. Oh. It, 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 it echoes in the mic. Oh, gotcha. sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was Bams. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, we both we both work with Phil Raven. Yes, we actually I've met you because uh, we were doing that uh, that hike in January. Uh, yes, I almost died. He, the <laughs> first hike of the first hike. Yeah, so uh, yeah, go ahead. Let's hear so, about your experience. Right. Yo, um, hey George, would you like to go on a hike? <laughs> say, <laughs> say uh, when? Oh, you know this weekend. Wait, you mean the coldest weekend coming of the year so far? Oh, yeah, it was like fourteen degrees. Oh, on the ground, but we're we're not even talking about the elevation uh, of the hike. Let me interrupt. So you know, yeah, why not? Sure, I'm down. Never been hiking before in my life. You know what I'm saying? But I got the gear. I look like you know I belong. Got, I'm, I'm, I'm like one of those motherfuckers that show up with the J's on. You know the Olas. <laughs> I, I fit the role. You know what I'm saying? You did. You did. So I show up. You know, everybody's like, "Yo, hey man, welcome." Because, like, I understand this process and like what you what you were trying to build at the time what process um kind of like you're working with a brand and you're doing your thing and somebody from the brand is coming along right and yeah. it's like you can see like some of the people just go fucking like some of the um some of the mayonnaise gets super extra light mayonnaise you know? <laughs> <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> What are you talking about right so, now? Because some of your because you had some of your outsiders people there, right? And yeah. you weren't there at the time, so I'm the only person dressed head to toe Fjall Raven. Right. So they all thought I was like, oh, the guy, yeah, 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 yeah. So they're like, oh, oh, who's that guy? So, so, so George is actually a Phil Raven ambassador. For those yeah. of you who don't know Phil Raven, they're a Swedish outdoor apparel company. You might know them from their backpacks, the square backpacks. Everyone seems to have the white, and the Konkin, yeah, the Konkin backpacks, right? And uh, we did a, that really cold hike. Yeah. And you, were, you came with uh, Martina. Yeah, Martina. Uh, ambassadors. Yes. And I, you showed up. You were fully kitted out. Yeah, I was fully kitted out. Like, but well, I this, had... guy, this guy knows what he's doing. Like, I cool about an expert. No. And then uh, the hike, you know, we, we start the hike. And I'm leading the hike. Yeah. And, um, and I, get, I hear on the radio because we got little ear, earpieces. I hear on the radio, we got we to gotta fall back. Uh, yeah. George from Phil Raven is struggling. Yeah, I'm dying. <laughs> I'm basically dying. So I'm, going, I'm doing this hike, B. And like five minutes into it, my quads are like, yo, what's wrong with you, bro? Um, hanging out, like going even more. It's like, yo, how long is this hike? Oh, it's like an hour and a half. <laughs> what? I'm looking back at the, at the oh, base. Man. Like, when you caught up, when you caught up, you look like you ran a marathon. You were, oh, yeah, I was you were like Patrick Ewing at the free throw line. Oh, yeah, like primetime Pat, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, we're talking 90, 97, 98 Pat, finger roll Pat. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That bitch-ass move. We ain't going to talk about that oh, shit, man. though. But, um, go, so, so. so, yeah, I, that was my first hike. It really kicked my butt. Um, I think my, yeah, my heart rate had peaked multiple times. <laughs> well, I got to say, I got to say. Apple Watch was like, yo, are you okay? That, that hike kicked your ass. But what's funny is that the following hikes, and I don't know if you started hitting the gym, but the following hikes from there on out, you were keeping up with all of oh, them. Oh, no, it, 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 because I never wanted to be that guy again. Yeah, but how did you just snap and be like, I don't uh, want to fall back behind? Like, No, I, that's why I, I, I'm always in the beginning because, like, if I – so it's a mental thing for me, right? Right, yeah. I know so saying, it's yeah. like if I'm in the front and I'm leading, I'm good. You keep the pace. Yeah, I'm keeping so pace. Gotta have, you'd rather have be with a pace setter. Yeah, than to, to be in the back kind of like shooting the shit, yeah. hanging out with everybody. You right. know what I'm saying? So that's what I figured out. That's how I do good on these hikes yeah. now. So I just like, I'm running right in the front with Jillian. If I'm in the yeah. back, like. You well, I want to get back into the outsiders in a second. Yeah. Like, you, you mentioned Patrick Ewing, the free throw, the, oh, the layup God. and all that. Charles, let's talk about Charles Smith. How forget about this that five one? blocks Charles Smith got blocked. Who cares? I let's do. talk about, you're obviously a New York native. 
No, I'm not a New York You're native. You're not. I was born in South America, and my family migrated when wait, I was wait. really young. Where Where were you born in South America? Why were you born there? Um, I don't know. This is kind of like where we ended up after the whole like slavery thing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh man. Okay, where? Oh my god, this is this is gonna be an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, I don't Busting know. my balls the whole time. <laughs> no, I just say like you asked me a question. I'm but where where in South America? Uh, I'm from the so by default I'm gonna be very prideful. This is this is as South American as I'm gonna be. So I come from a country called Guyana. It is not an island like the rest of the Caribbean. It's only part of the Caribbean because it's the only English-speaking country in South America. That being said, Guyana's big enough to hold every single Caribbean island within its confines and still have space left over. It also has the longest single-drop waterfall in the world, the Kaichor Falls. So it, we should probably do that for an outsider of this trip. Yeah, oh shit. They would, first off, they major in ecotourism. Um, 84% of the country's rainforest. How many, so when you were born there, how old were you when you came here? I was like five. So do you remember much time over there? Oh yeah, because my parents would um, basically, um, to keep me out of the streets, basically, say, hey, school's over, buddy. It's time for you to catch a flight, homie. Would you ever consider like moving back there? Um, I, have, I'm sure you have like great memories. I have great memories. I still have family there. Um, I'm thirsty. I'm gonna crack this beer. Yeah, let's go for it. Hey, shout out to um, Fat Tire. Fat Tire. Yeah, Fat Tire for making it happen. Cheers, buddy. Cheers. Thank you, I'll sir. Reach you. Ah, that's, that's good. great. That's good. So let's get back into it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Guyana is beautiful. Um, it also has 365 islands in the country. So it has a island for every day how'd you oh that's cool yeah. how'd you end up uh coming to brooklyn like your parents came here um, your family or yeah so my grandfather who is 102 as we speak plus some days oh, wow. um, shout out to granddad i haven't seen him in like over a year because you know the pandemic and shit and he's in uh guyana no nah, he's in brooklyn my grandfather's in brooklyn okay. he's chilling yeah nice. he's good he's at the crib right now if i call him he pick up the phone he's gonna call him all we on this interview what time is it Nah, he can't. It's, it's 10.30. He's 102, B. Come on. It's not like he got homies he could link with. You know what I mean? Like, granddad, and, he don't got no homies he could link with. You know what I'm saying? All his Except friends are you. dead. You know? yeah. But that's my man's. The, of yo, so, all right. Low key for his, um, for his 102nd birthday, if it wasn't for Corona 19 um, coming. Corona 19. <laughs> Uh, if I didn't know you were this funny, man. If it wasn't for Corona-19, um, my <laughs> grandfather and I had a plan to go to Vegas because he's oh, never really? been to Vegas. And I, I, on everything I love, granddad, bro, you here for 103? We in Vegas, B. <laughs> we're Le in like, Vegas for Pops, little granddad. Yeah, what? First off. What do you have? In, what's your plan with, with granddad? First off, granddad is going to have oxygen. Um, he's going to rhinos. Granddad is getting the works. Be like, <laughs> if, if, yo, to quote my man, what's his name? Drago from Rocky. <laughs> yeah. He, he dies. He dies. Be granddad is going out on top. If he oh dies, he dies. God. It's meant to be. Yo, how, yo, <laughs> be, you live, yo, my grandfather literally said, yo, I've never been to Vegas. This man has been everywhere. He's ever wanted to go. Right. Yeah. I just, I want to take a pause and say, you just quoted Drago and said, if he dies, he dies. But look at how he dying, though. Shit, I'd want to go out like that at 103. <laughs> Continue, please. But yeah, <laughs> me and granddad going to Vegas if, if he's around for 103. See, I thought I was, my, my grandmother, she's a little too old to do this now. Not too old, she doesn't want to go. But she wanted, uh, she had a dream of going to Patagonia, mm. Argentina. She read a book uh, by Jules Verne, I believe. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember. And she's going to kill me for not remembering this, but... Uh, it's all about like, this, this trip to Patagonia and I was going to get her a trip there a couple of years ago and she told me I just can't I can't go at can't this point because it's like a lot of hiking and mm. spacious and you want to go to Vegas with your grandpa <laughs> yeah because like my grandfather is the my grandfather is the person that the male the patriarch of the family for me 
that was extremely influential in my life. He gave me a bunch of kind of like golden rules to live by, and it's worked out. Motherfucker's 103. He knows yeah. some shit. You know what I'm saying? He like gave me the you never chase money because if you made it once, you'll make it again. Um, you don't chase public transportation. There's always <laughs> another bus five minutes away. Okay. You know, um, don't chase don't chase after women. They outnumber you. They outlive you. And there's always a new model willing to take the take the old model's place for the same price. So he got okay. he yeah, got yeah. some knowledge. You know what I'm saying? So. so he's the reason why your parents. He was in Brooklyn before you came. Mm, yeah, he was. He's the reason that we migrated. So okay. him, uh, he migrated. Then my aunts migrated. And then my mom, and then, yeah. So you came here with your mom, obviously. Yeah, my mom and my dad, yeah. Do you have siblings? I have five younger sisters. Five younger sisters. I call them the curse and the gift. (laughs) What what about them as a curse and what about them as a gift? Well, who wants to be a young man with five younger sisters? Like They could be older sisters. Then, yeah. Yeah. That's why they're the curse and the gift. Exactly. Uh, So Uh, the gift is that they really prepped me for dealing with women in my life. I learned at an early age I couldn't hit women. So, okay, I mean, at least you learned that, yeah. Oh, no, like, because my father ensured that I learned the ramifications of putting my hands on a woman. Yeah. And somebody else is going to put their hands on you. Yeah. So, like, I learned real fast that I couldn't hit my sisters, but I could really play mind games. So I could, I could... Jedi mind tricks, I'm well versed. I have a sister. Um, she's the mother of my second niece. This is my second oldest niece. And she loves burnt toast to this day. And she'll probably see this and figure it out that I'm the reason she loves burnt toast because I couldn't hit her, but we'd beef. And every time she's going into the shower, I just burn her toast when she goes <laughs> into the shower. Let's get back on track here, burnt toast. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I so yes. when, when you was it like a cultural shock for you to come to? to oh hell yeah, come, everything completely different, new. What I wish I knew now, and I could tell younger me, is yo stay authentic. Don't That's move. actually one of our questions, the interview questions. What yeah, would like, you tell younger you? Stay authentic. Stay authentic. Don't don't give up your accent, your belief. Well, not your, did, your beliefs you change. Did you put effort into losing your accent? Fuck yeah. Really? Hell yeah. I The only time my accent can come out now is if I'm around other Guyanese people and they're talking like that. If mm-hmm. not... Were you made fun? I mean, you, you grew up in Brooklyn. I mean, yeah, of course. Brooklyn. Of but there's course a huge Caribbean popul- population. <laughs> really? Kids are fucking... Kids are fucking evil. Yeah. Yeah, you know little kids are evil. So when you came here, other than obviously changing your accent and all that, was there any other cultural... Shocks for you? Oh, yeah. Gangs were real. I figured that out real fast. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, so this is, when did you realize that? You came here when you were five? Mm-hmm. What, what were the first years, few years like? I'm sure they changed as you got to a teenager. You, you yeah. talked a little oh, bit yeah. about that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it was all fun and games until, let's say, high school. So b- it, before like, high school, things were just like you're just a kid. Yeah, you're just chilling, yeah. doing your shit, running through it. Like, so what happened in high school? Um, the first time I got robbed, at, yeah, because I wasn't, I don't think I was as tall as I am now. And I was very, I should, I, I lacked a shitload of confidence in myself back then. Mm-hmm. But the first time I got robbed. So and then when he did it the second time, I was like, all right, same that's guy. It. Uh, yeah, after that, was that was it. School? it. Yeah, it was school. So, so you knew who robbed you. What do you steal? Oh, like a fucking bus pass, I think. Okay. And then the next time, like maybe 10 bucks. But it was a... It's a very fucked up feeling to feel helpless in an uncontrollable situation, mm-hmm. right? And the only thing you can think of is using violence is the answer to get you get that shit to stop, right? So what happened the third time? Oh, the th- there was no third time. What happened the second time? No, after the second time, um, I don't know, called my cousin, got a stick. We was good. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I wish a motherfucker would. 
So yeah, that's the kind of li- life I was so living. From, I know. So from there on out, you kind of lived a life where oh, you were the aggressor. I wasn't the aggressor, but I there was no reason for me to back down anymore. Mm-hmm. Right? Like. So tell me, tell me what that was like. What was your day to day like then? The day to day was. Wow, I hope you know if my mother sees this, but whatever. I mean, you, yo, listen. my bad. I just hit the mic. My bad. The um, truth of the matter is, you've obviously changed your ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I changed my ways, yeah. but my day to day was literally like, I honestly, in, I don't know if anybody experienced else experienced this, but I go to sleep with like a Glock under my pillow. And this this was a, a daily thing for you. This was like every day, like. Psh. And you, would you you would carry this as well? Yeah, it'd be in my backpack. So how long did this last? How many times did you have to have to use it? Like, um, luckily never had to use it. I ended up selling it because I didn't use did it. Did you show it? Mm, not really, because I wanted to be tried. You so know? you wanted it? Oh, I wanted somebody to test me. Yeah. Because I was ready to make an example of like anyone so how old were you in this period oh uh, i was in like so this went from 16 to like 19. so like, from 16 to 19 you carried a gun with you most times oh yeah always there so what changed women. what changed between the, to, to have you stop women carrying? women women yeah it, um how <laughs> so this just all right so this really cute haitian girl yeah all right um valerie lived on the block that my grandfather still lives on. Mm-hmm. What uh, part of Brooklyn are you from, by the way? East Flatbush, but I'm in bed for most of my life. Gotcha. Um, so yeah. Valerie was, I don't know, like teenage crush, man. Like, yeah. But her father was on like, oh, he's a vagabond. You can, you don't bring the vagabond in the house. Patience? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. And yeah. he, he had the vagabond shit and... It made me rethink my approach to how I used to kind of deal with things. And you know, I, I didn't know that story. You told me another story. Oh yeah, that, yeah, yeah. But that's was that the that's same a, time. Was that later on? No, that's later on. Oh really? But, but so that was just, another woman too that like stared that that story. Yeah, I remember that. So, so this one story with your Haitian that, girlfriend. Yeah. So that's what got me to kind of like rethink my daily tools in my toolkit yeah and i kind of taught myself how to type um got a good job so that inspired you to become a better person well i'll take a step towards that direction yeah definitely take a step uh it was for i just hated the fact that her father just judged me based on something he had no clue what that persona was driven by. Sorry for the technical difficulties, but we got, yo, on do it. we need to clap it in? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> good so, uh, back to that question. Um, yeah. She helped you, I guess, make the step in the right direction? No. So, all right. Let's backtrack. My father and I, we've never really had a good relationship, right? Um, it's a dickhead kid. He was a young father, whatever, right? But nothing kind of like fucks with me more mentally than like a male figure telling me I can't do some shit. It's like, oh, word, all right, cool. I mean, That's what that you believe. Be tough for anybody. Yeah, I so, grew up with that. Yeah, but for me, it was like I to quote one of my favorite rappers, like. I prefer to swallow blood than to beg you for something. Mm. You know what I'm saying? That's the who, approach who I that? hove. You know what I'm saying? Don't, we didn't even go, go down that road. I give you hove bars for life, you know, you know, say just the general life and yeah, shit. Yeah. But um yeah, with that being said, I didn't like the fact that her father thought that of me and he knew nothing of me, right? Right. And but he wasn't entirely wrong either though. Yeah, he was. Cause, I mean, but he knew. Because, uh, I, I, cause, like, not for nothing, she's divorced. I'm not. So he was wrong. Talking about now? <laughs> Let's say he fucked up. <laughs> We're not petty or anything. We're just oh, no, nah, no, nah, it's not petty. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just stating facts. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. win is win, loses lose. You know what I'm right. saying? So, so, okay, so you, you kind of made a step towards the right direction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
So when was that other incident? How far after that? About. We'll talk about that in a sec. So for me, it was. So I go through these phases where when I'm not challenged, I just basically throw it all away, Mm -hmm. you know, and what ends up happening, what ended up happening with me was um, something along the lines of the whole Valerie thing, her and I, that, that never worked out. But I did get a really good job at AIG. Um, insurance was like my first love. Um, first love, really? You were passionate about insurance? Fuck yes. If you ne- insurance is, what is it? Any, anytime you can convince human beings, right, to pay based on the laws of probability, like, hey, you'll probably die. Yes, you will. But when? You don't know. But with that being said, if you pay me $100 a year, for 30 years, I can promise that when you die, I'm going to PC everybody off. Mm-hmm. And people do that shit. Insurance is based on the laws of probability. Right. Like, you might get sick. You might not. But you got health insurance, right? Yeah. And you paying that shit anyway. Okay, so you are, you are passionate about insurance. That's no, weird. It's, that's cool. it, it was, because, <laughs> no, for me, it was like the first time seeing a legal hustle, right? Right. I was like, wait, What? Yeah. Holy shit! I didn't know that's what insurance was. Yeah. Got that job, enjoyed it. Um, really got to a place where I was making the money I liked. Had a title I liked. How old were you then? Say I was like 24, 25. Okay. Yeah. And um, was traveling the world, dating someone I thought this is I, prior to becoming a photographer. Yeah, right? prior to becoming a photographer, dating a girl that I thought. Was the world? Um, we go everywhere, you know, running all over. Meanwhile, I have a grandmother who's in South America, who is my first love. You know, like it's not my mother; it's my grandmother because your mother's your mother, but your grandmother gives you. Wait! Whoa! 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 Leave the boy alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you she's used to do this. She's from yeah. your mom, yeah. She's protecting me from my mom, my grandma, my, my yeah. father, everybody. It was my yeah. grandmother, right? She was like my dragon lady. And I've achieved all these alleged accomplishments and living this kind of lifestyle. And speak to her maybe two months before my birthday. And I'm like, she's like, hey, when are you going to come home and see me? I haven't seen you. X amount of years. I'm like, yo, granny, going on this vacation, da 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 da. But I'm gonna come home for my birthday. And she died on the 23rd of March. Mm-hmm. And it really fucked with me, right? In the sense that I put so much time and effort into trying to straighten my life out and walk this path and be on this and live this life. Mm-hmm. And I chased the money, you know, like, I was making fucking 70 grand Mm -hmm. in my 20s. You couldn't tell me shit. I had a fucking Amex corporate card. Like, couldn't tell me shit, B. Like, I go out, we're going to blow $1,000. It's going to get signed off by my boss, and we're good. Like, don't worry about it. But what I lost was time with my grandmother, and to this day, I would give all of that up yeah. for five minutes with her, you know, because it really fucked me up in the sense that the way I looked at loss and um, the way that I approached it, it was something up until, so you guys don't know this, but Jeremy and I, we were on a trip recently, the camping trip, right? Mm-hmm. And... Like, I saw, I was dealing with some stuff, but up until that day, when that happened, I was speaking to this friend of mine. She's been, like, really cool at trying to give me perspective on shit. Based of, in regards to regretting... Just, seeing, yeah, dealing yeah. with loss and, like, the yeah. things that I feel that I've sacrificed. I know it sounds like I'm rambling, but we're going to get back to the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? It's just that... At times, I felt like I've sacrificed everything in life to have these moments and experiences. And I've had to really readjust to how I look at that sacrifice and the things that I've put up for it. Because at the end of the day, I know my grandmother 
as long as I'm happy, she's happy, mm -hmm. you know, and one of these rules that I have in any relationship that I have, whether it be a friendship, romantic, if my 102 year old grandfather could understand that I'm going to be at work and I'm going to miss his birthday, nobody else could say anything to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said that, yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. like those things really became important to me after dealing with loss and not knowing how to deal with it because I sacrificed everything. And that's perspective you, you gained in yeah. the more recent years. In the more recent years. But prior to that, what ended up happening, got the job at AIG, living the good life, grandmother dies, fucking throws it all, throw it all away, walked away from my job. And even called him and said, I was like, yo, my grandmother died. They are like, but I don't give a fuck, click. Um, and you never went back? Never went back. So what'd you do there? Um, went to Canada, um, broke up with my girlfriend at that point. Um, yeah, I just like literally just said fuck everything and just walked away from it all. I went to Canada, lived there for like a year. What did you do in Canada? Um, I have an uncle there okay. who uh, has a catering business. So allegedly or maybe, um, you know, I helped out around. Yeah, yeah. Allegedly, I don't know, but my yeah. uncle made sure I was good. Yeah. I made sure he was good. Yeah. And um, I chilled there for a year. And then my mother's like, yo, when are you coming home? And I'm a mama's boy, so I'm like, fuck it. I'm out. And what, uh, when you came home, what did you do? When I came home, I was still doing some really, some real vagabond shit. Like, so you went back into that lifestyle? I went back into that lifestyle because, you know, it's like, it is what it is. At that point, it's what I... It's not what I know, but it's really comfortable to do. It's easy to do. You know, like... What's easier? That at this point or where you're at now? Um, that's the whole thing, right? That's always there. It's all... Like, right. To this day, I get... I have conversations with people about, hey, if you're ever interested in... Like, yo, yeah. let's let me know. And we're good. You know... Um, so you, you live that I, lifestyle, and was that incident that we talked about, and we're going to bring mm -hmm. it up if you're cool with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally was cool. that what kind of broke you out of that lifestyle um, again? No, actually. So the incident Jeremy's referring to is the fact that I have a metal plate right here in my head. Um, someone tried to kill me. How? Uh, he hit me in my head with a hammer. So you were hitting the head with a hammer? Yeah. And you, remember, you told me the story. So the story know. is that, wow. Man, did my parents ever see this shit? They're just going to be like, <laughs> so, really? Because <laughs> I'm too old to get <coughs> be a beaten, but I'll get a talking to, you know what I'm saying? Say, so this is what you were doing, da, 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 da. But um, what ended up happening was, so I don't know if, um, I'm hoping the audience is old enough to have seen Bad Boy too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Compare your life to Bad Boy too. Uh, no, here's why. Because it's a very, it's a very poignant, poignant point, right? In the guns, in the chase scene at the end when they're on the beach and Will Smith leans out the car and he sticks that gun out. That's like a semi-auto yeah. slash nine. Uh -huh. That was my gun. That was. I had gun. that shit before he had that shit. Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, my boy Ali, that um. Used to be on the cor at the corner store. Um, he's back in Yemen now. What up, Bob? Mm -hmm. um, he was my boy. And I'd just be like, so I got it from my homie in Miami who had figured out a way to get it up here. And um, I had it. And then um, the night before, I, I was in the hallway with another homie. We were like smoking weed. And somebody said something to me that just aggravated me and just like gnawed at me. And so living the lifestyle of just like having a gun around you at all times, it's very easy to let your ego and emotion kind of kick in. And I woke up the next day and I wanted to kill this motherfucker, right? So I spent, I woke up literally, grabbed my backpack, like got dressed, went up the block, spoke to Al. He's like, yo, I don't like that motherfucker either. What you need? It's like, I need, like, 16. It's like, fuck it. Here's 40. Go. 40 what? Shells. So, loaded up. Kind of, like, spent the day driving around looking for this motherfucker. Um, couldn't find him. Like, every place I went that I knew he would be, 
<laughs> he wasn't. But the week prior, I had met this. It's going to sound like I have a fetish when I say this. I met another Haitian woman. And after that, spending that day looking for him, couldn't find him. She had hit me up like that night. She's like, yo, what are you doing? Da, 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 da. You trying to come through tomorrow? I'm free. Nobody's home. Mm -hmm. Be here by 11. Say less. I'm in. Yeah. Um, so I get dressed the next day to hop a dollar cap to the 90s to go check Shorty. And um, as I'm walking up the block, I see one of his mans. His man's is like, yo, what up? What's, up? what's good with you? I'm like, shit, what's good with you? Like, he's like, yo, you talking crazy about my boy? I'm like, listen, man, me and you got no beef, but, you know what I'm saying, me and this dude, we got shit to settle. And he's like, oh, word? I'm like, yeah, word. But anyway, I'm trying to get laid, so I'm, fuck y'all, I'm out. Yeah. And I turn to walk away, and the next thing I know, um, I'm in the ER, I'm holding this side of my head, and it's like somebody's in there with like a fucking nail, like fucking poking my brain. And this dude, Dread, that we used to all hang out with, is filling out paperwork, right? And they're like, what happened to him? And he's like, oh, somebody hit him in his head with a hammer. Then the next thing I remember is them telling me, oh, Mr. McKenzie, could we cut your clothes open? We need to attach this equipment to you. And I was like, oh, give me a second. And like puke like a three liter three liters worth of blood, Ugh. and then like they hooked me up. I guess I was stable at that point, and then they transferred me over to Kings County. So I'm in Kings County. I'm like getting my bearings back, and now I'm getting pissed. And I'm, literally, I'm just in pain, and all now it's on every. Fuck it, mm -hmm. the whole I'm gonna scorch the whole block, and. God bless this doctor, right? Because she really, she had me by the balls. She's, I was like, yo, I need to go. But if I sat up, like, I literally couldn't stand up. There was, I was in so much pain. I was like, yo, I need you to make me feel good enough so I can walk out of here. She's like, listen, I can make you, I can be one better. I can make you feel good enough that you might even live. And I was like, whatever, right? She's like, no, here's the deal, Mr. McKenzie. If I make you feel better, you can't leave because then I'm going to have two of you guys in here, right? So you have Meaning to that you're going to go. Oh, yeah, there. I'm going to go and do what I got to do. And then, like, yeah, someone else is going to be in here. Someone else is going to be in here, right? Yeah. So with that being said, she was like, here's the deal. Like, if you want to feel good. I'll take care of you, but you can't leave. You have to stay here and let me do my job. And I was in too much pain to fight with her about it. And I swallowed it. I laid back down. And here we are today. But, yeah. So that made you realize you need to change your ways? Oh, hell no. That was just me being... So what made you realize you had to change your ways? What made me realize I had to change my ways is that... If that's not going to make you realize, what is it? Oh, it was... So it was photography, right? <laughs> so that's what got you into photography. No, that was, that slowed me down. It stopped me from living that lifestyle. Right. It's like, yo, all right, if you're going to live this lifestyle, these are the ramifications that you have to deal with. People will take shots at your life. You know, people... You will be scarred for life. Right. You know... Well, you, are, you have a scar. So you I have are, a scar here, and yeah. I have a, a whole thing that goes across the top of my head. Because they had to peel the head, peel the skin back, and put the metal plate in because the swelling was so bad. Oof. I'm still trying to find the video, but Kings County don't want to give me this shit. I want to see what my face looks like half peeled. Why would you want to see that? Why wouldn't you? Think about that. I'm trying to think of, figure out why I'd want to see it. But why wouldn't you, though? Like, okay. don't you want <laughs> Anyway. I, 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 I probably want to see it. You want to see that? Yeah, I mean, I've had, I've had seven surgeries. I don't want to see that. Yeah, like, you, you, you're like, yeah, I got my back. I'm like, ooh. You're like, yo, I got a video of that shit? <laughs> I'm sure they do. All right, we're getting off track. Yeah, yeah, here. my bad. So, all right, so you got into photography. I got into, so, so that slowed me down, right? And I had to, like, think about my life in general. And what brought you towards photography? What brought me towards photography was um, 
It was outside of the City Nightclub in Manhattan. On, I think it's on Which nightclub? City, City Nightclub. Oh, City Nightclub. Yeah. City Nightclub. Okay. No, City. My bad. Fuck, man. Why are you, why are you coming for me like that, bro? Nah, I'm just asking because I know nightclubs. <laughs> All right. We ain't going to talk about that. Um, <laughs> but I was outside the city one night after being inside. It was like, you know, Labor Day, City Nightclubs ran by like a Guyanese, Guyanese people. Okay, they yeah, really yeah. celebrated like Labor Day and shit like that. It was an all white party. Yep. And they're being super thotty. And the shorty I was trying to kick it with was like, yo, meet me outside. And we'll talk. She's like, don't try to talk to me here. Like, I'm trying to dance. It's too yeah. hot. Like, just meet me outside. We had fun. Like, meet me outside. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, bet. So as I'm waiting for her, I noticed the event photographer. Shout out to David Paul, at David Paul Online. He is the guy that I saw talking to this young lady and her friends. And they were all, like, hugging him, like, Kissed him on the cheek. Oh my God, David! So I you look got so motivated good. to become a photographer by ladies. Oh, women have controlled a lot of decisions I've made in my life. Listen, I'm going to tell you, somebody who uses a camera, 99% of dudes who shoot photography, that's probably one of the main reasons. Yeah, they, do they don't want to admit it. They don't like a lot of photography. So that's one of the things about almost losing your life. What it does to you, right? Why should I bullshit you? I have no reason to bullshit mm -hmm. you. So. I got into photography because... What kind of photography do you get into first? Oh, event photography. Urban event photography. So how did you end up going... What's the... What was the... I So I met um, Chinadu from Seven Days, Seven Nights. Chinadu Ernesto. He's the director, film filmmaker, a drone pilot. Um, he was a photographer that would be at the West Indian parties. And... I go and I see him. I talk to him. I'm like, yo, I want to do this. Yeah. And he's like, he's like, yo, I'm running the split here, man. Take the camera, go shoot. Yeah. And I go, like, Ch -ch -ch, make it happen. And then he'd be like, all right, you kind of got an eye. So you want to do this and get paid? So you like, do, how long did you do that for? Well, like a, I did seven days, seven nights for like maybe four years. And then when did you transition over to where I'm at now? Like wildlife photography. Ooh, like, years later. Uh, so I did seven days, seven nights for a few years. Um, then I met Johnny Nunez. I know Johnny. Shout out to yeah. Johnny Nunez, yeah. Yeah, so shout out to Johnny. I used to be one of the Johnny's guys. Mm -hmm. So like if he's doing something else, he'd send one of us to cover yeah. it. Da, 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 da. We'd make sure we do a good job. Da, 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 da. So did that. And then for a while after and then one night after doing an event with Johnny I was being cheap he paid me and instead of like hop no I'm lying I was being cheap plus yellow cab drivers are fucking racist so fuck those guys um facts so I'm instead of jumping in the cab because I want to go to Brooklyn and these motherfuckers think that I don't got enough money to get to bedside it's like B, come on! I live like you're you're literally parked in front of one of the hottest clubs in fucking Soho, and you really think I don't got money to get home? It's like all right, whatever. I walk to the F train, jump on the F train, I pass out. B, <laughs> I wake up one stop away from fucking Coney Island. Oh wow! With my fucking bag empty, mm. camera gear gone. I was like knocked. I was sick. Rode the train all the way back to fucking 33rd to go to the lost and found department to hear these motherfuckers say, oh, we don't open until 7. You got to call this number. You just report it. There's nothing we can do. You don't have insurance? Oh, so bad. Damn. Next. It's fucking MTA. So fuck the M, the T, and the A. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, all three of them motherfuckers. But yeah, I lost my shit, and... I basically left photography after that because photography is extremely expensive. Like, you can ask the photographers that are here. These no, we, cameras we know are, it. Trust me, we know we got all this stuff. Yeah, so, this gear is this gear we're, we're is not low, cheap. We're getting low on time. I want to make sure. Yeah, we yeah. But points. anyway, got into that, and a few years later, I'm working for LG. I'm the market manager for LG Consumer Electronics. I'd okay. be at CES every year. Da 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 da. Whatever. Ran into Chin one day. He's working for Flowrider. He's like, yo, um, so I'm in New York, and I need a photographer. And what's up? 
I'm like, yo, you know I don't have the camera. He's like, that's cool. I need you to be there tomorrow at 7, Radio City Music Hall. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow at 7, I was there with a camera, um, and I was back in the game after that. I started working at a camera at a camera store called Adorama, mm -hmm. and I met one of my mentors, who is a National Geographic Society ah, so wildlife that's, photographer. That's the entry into wildlife photography. Yeah, and I did what everyone does to Nat Geo photographers. Yo, can I be your assistant? Yeah. Can I be your assistant? Can I be your assistant? Like, sure. You have no clue what the fuck that is, but. Yeah. If you feel like you can do it, sure. I did that to him for like a year straight, but we had developed a rapport and I had met his wife. Every th time he was in New York, I'd make a concerted effort to like engage and like meet him and show that I was really serious about this, even though I had no clue what the fuck I was walking so into. What, uh, what was your first gig as a wildlife photographer? What were you shooting? Um, my first, so my break in, so if for all of you who might see this and go to my Instagram, you'll notice that there's a bunch of pigeons on my page. So my first ever job for National Geographic magazine was to basically produce a shoot in New York City on the, some of the smartest birds in New York City. And I didn't know that... Um, Pigeons were considered this, one of the smartest birds in New York City. I'm like, Makes sense. Why would you? And I'm like, being in New York, I'm like, yo, what the fuck? why would you want to take pigeons or, you know, rats or wings? Right. And he's like, um, George, they're some of the most cognitive birds you've ever met. <laughs> and I'm like, what the So he's from Jersey? <laughs> nah. <laughs> I wish. He's like, so here, this is how small this fucking world is. He's from Bristol, England where my cousin and his family is from the same really? area as my mentor. Oh, wow, that's crazy. And they both coexisted and lived without, I'm the common the so, dominator between the two of them. But that was my first what's story. What's funny is that when people, when you tell people you're a wildlife photographer in New York City, people say, what do you shoot, pigeons and rats? Yeah. But you actually shot pigeons, pigeons and, rats. and rats. I've yeah. done it, yeah. So I know the smell of rat piss. Um, it's the reason I don't sit on the ground in the park, but once again, with the right woman in the right moment, anything is possible. Right. <laughs> you know, it's the story of my life, V. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? You gotta find your wife, man. Nah, chill. I'm good. Uh, you know what I'm <laughs> saying? Like, I'm out here just living me, living my life, okay, you know, okay. doing it. Hanging out everyday people. I see. Hey, you know, things happen. Shout out to MoMA. <laughs> yeah, shout out to you, MoMA. You know, shout out to AQ, Jermaine, Nolo, all the yeah. people. Um, um, but yeah, that's how I got into it, and it's been something that's, so getting into wildlife photography on the level that I've been able to do it on, every chance I've gotten to do an assignment has changed my perception of this, the subject, and that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about wildlife photography, because for me, being a kid that was raised in the inner city of Brooklyn, New York, um, this really, being exposed to wildlife comes from the Discovery Channel and like mythical things that your parents tell you about that, to be perfectly honest, they know nothing of. Right. Because they didn't experience it. Right. You know what I'm saying? So. But it, there is a, a magical sense of, of nature and wildlife that, because especially coming from the city, we don't. We, we don't, don't get see to see stuff. it. Yeah. We don't, but I feel. One I, of the I've been noticing more more uh birds lately because whenever you're riding with us yeah i'm like pointing it out like pointing because it out. yeah because like, i'm a psycho about it these hawks falcons eagles and yeah I'm they're like, out here george would appreciate that yeah so it's one of those things and and that's why this is so important for me as a black man to be able to share this knowledge and experience because conservation is cool and saving the planet is cool but we all need to be have a vested interest in this right and, and, when, and, and knowing about it will help you. Yeah, have, have, a, it, have a vested exactly. interest yeah. in it. In, it's like, the, like, you know, you said something that I, my bad, I really didn't get a chance to, like, jump in and, like, really support my point, which was, yeah, we see, you know, squirrels and pigeons and rats, right? But this wildlife, honestly, it exists in 
how we interact with the wildlife is really important. So when you see the pigeons, don't chase them. Like, guess what pigeons are? Pigeons are great bio indicators for your environment. Like if you're seeing dead pigeons, like randomly dead in your neighborhood, there's something wrong with the water supply in your neighborhood. Mm, you should yeah. really look into that. Call 311 <laughs> and check on that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and if you're seeing way too many rats, then guess what? The garbage situation in your neighborhood is getting out of control. Which also spreads disease and so on. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, and people tell you, well, you're going to get diseases if pigeons, if pigeons poop falls in your food. I don't know. Do you not get disease if dog shit falls in your food? <laughs> maybe I'm just, maybe I'm different. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I don't eat dog shit, but, you know. Um, let's, let's get into some of these, like, yeah, these questions it. here. So what does success mean to you? What are, like, what are your goals and dreams and what does success mean to you? Success means to me that this space that is the wildlife, the biodiversity, I see more, I see more faces that look like me. That's what success means because I want, it needs to matter to everybody, mm -hmm. right? It can't matter to the people who, well, I have the financial capability to like, you know, chill at home and recycle. Right. Like show the mother that doesn't have the financial flexibility to chill at home and recycle, how she can have play a role and have an impact in this because her kids matter too, right? That's interesting because most people answer that question with what success, what's they see success as for themselves. And that's success for you, which is great. Oh. It's so selfless. No, so I appreciate because, that because it's, it's, it's not, here's the thing, Jeremy, like I don't ever want to like be food for these little kids. You know what I'm saying? Be food, you're saying? Yeah, be food. Like, I don't want them to look at me and see, like, yo, okay, I could take his jacket, his pants, his watch, his glasses. I don't want to be food. Okay. So it's in my best interest to educate these young people on how they can go get food. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? I see what you're saying now, yeah. So, no, I don't want to be food, but I would love to see people that look like me when I walk into a room, in a room, that we can all level up. So your personal goal is to be able to inspire and do that. No, my personal goal is to literally create opportunities for mm. people that look like me so they can be part of the solution, not part of the you know conversation. That's bullshit. That's a beautiful, selfless dream and goal, man. Nah, like, bro, I got five sisters, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'll be all right in life. <laughs> I got my next question for you is what's your favorite part of Outsiders? Favorite part of Outsiders, honestly... It's going to be very kind of like selfish. I like the challenge of going on the hike mm -hmm. and like the results of like, it's like going home is when I hate, I hate it. Right. I don't, I don't love it going home because like you sit on the train and like my fucking muscles are like, what the fuck were you thinking to be? <laughs> And you got to do this shit again tomorrow. You're fucking insane. Yeah. I'm like hating, hating Jillian, cursing everybody at this point. <laughs> you know, but like, I love the fact that I get to go and experience these things and breathe fresh air. I get to see eagles and hawks soar at these amazing heights. And like, we're literally right over there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I appreciate you pointing them out to the, to the people on the hikes. Yeah. Cause, because and, and you're also like, see that bird, the hawk up there, yeah. it's circling. It's about to attack. It's about to, you know, yeah. yeah. It's just going to die. Right, so he knows what he's talking about. And they die. Yeah, he's going to get something. Yeah. yeah. He's going to eat. So um, <clears throat> I don't want to be prey for that, for hawks. The no. Hawks of the street. <laughs> you might be a hawks of the street. Yeah. Um, what have I not asked you that you'd like to share with the audience? Something that maybe no one knows you want to share about yourself. So I'm really 6'2", I'm really black, and um, I actually really, really am in a seriously toxic relationship with the New York Knicks. Oh my God. That is a terrible relationship, my friend. Yeah, it's, a, see, it's the most toxic relationship I've ever been in my entire life. I don't want to start getting, getting into it, but as long as James Dolan is the owner, it's going to be toxic. It doesn't, it, like... We, we talk about this some other yeah, time. I'm just going to chalk it up to being, maybe I just, as you can see, I'm a dead, I'm a loyal. You know, so loyal. Yeah, you they are. won. I, they I'm, won. I'm sorry to hear that, my friend. <laughs> uh, all right, so the last segment of this show mm -hmm. is five rapid fire questions. Mm -hmm. okay? Go for so it. So whatever comes to mind, obviously rapid fire mm -hmm. means answer quickly. When you think of greatest of all time, who comes to mind? 
bitch ass Michael Jordan. <laughs> Smoking like a true New York Knicks fan. Yeah. Sorry for you, man. Okay. Uh, favorite city other than New York City? Does it have to be one? Uh, go ahead. Off the top of your head. Oh, so Toronto. Mm -hmm. We'll go with Toronto. Okay. Yeah. Toronto? Yeah. I've been gonna... there once. I, I did like it. I was there in March. It was so cold. I got to go there in the summer. I love the... I don't think you the cultural you, diversity. I feel like, um, excuse me, people from Canada, ban this man from your country. <laughs> you don't want him to come. If he comes, it's the secret is out. Well, hey, chill. We don't I've already been there once. What are you uh, yeah, about? you were there the, at the right time. Jeremy, you should always be in Toronto in March. It's a beautiful time. February, <laughs> March, January, it's amazing. <laughs> Just to piss him off. Okay, next question for you. Um, what's your favorite New York City wildlife? My favorite New York City wildlife, to be honest, it's the, um, the pigeons because they're my spark. They're the reason mm -hmm. I'm into wildlife. They changed the way that I looked at them by just being them. Okay. And I, I identify with that. And it's I feel crazy. like they're New York City's mascot in a sense. Um, it's between them and the rats. Can yeah. I just give you guys an interesting stat about the rats? Yeah, let's hear it. So for all those wonderful people tuning in, it's a minimum of eight to one rats, minimum. So if there's eight million people here, think about that. So yeah, eight next, times as many? minimum wow. eight times as many. Next question. Yes. Uh, dream location to shoot? Um, the Maasai Mara. Okay. Um, because to me, the whole Maasai family and the things that they have been able to do and achieve it's like mythical, right? It's almost like uh, safari land, right? Yeah, because the Maasai Mara, <laughs> the Maasai Mara is um, the Maasai Mara is so this, we, so this this really dope place where all the like the wildlife converge in yeah. that country and they go to these water holes and they yep. chill. So these the Maasai has been. They're called lion. They walk among the lions. They hunt lions and they chase and they protect their, their families, their livestock, with no guns. Yes. You know, so yeah. Like just straight old school shit. I've seen documentary on it and it's. And amazing. for me, it's as a black man documenting that, it would be it's something that's very powerful to me, right? Because yeah. it's me getting a chance to document history that's really important to my culture. Mm -hmm and done through my eyes. So I look at them as royalty, right? They well, have a certain eminence in my eyes. Let's that, find a way to make that happen. Yeah, so we'll see. I think, I think we can help you make that happen. Yeah. Um, my last question. Go for it. What's your favorite food? Um, so favorite food, I probably eat this every day. Shout out to my... My, my homie Khalil. Khalil, I told you I got you, bro. What do we got here? Let's uh, see. Khalil is, um, it's a tuna mustard, tuna, honey mustard, cheddar cheese um, on a hero. Okay, give me a half of that, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll split it. Because what Jeremy's not telling y'all, because he's being gracious, I ate my own sandwich when I got here because <laughs> I, I was fucking hungry. You know what I'm saying? I, I just needed a taste of sandwich. He's like, yo, just I just need a taste. So let's let's what's why is this your favorite food? And and keep on passing that over here. Um because it's why is it my favorite? Because of the simple fact that it's easy, it's simple. And I feel like dead ass though, if you fuck up tuna, I can't eat a your bodega no more, B. Mm. You so fucking tuna. up the tuna, like is you fucking up simple shit, B. Alright, let's try. I like, I like tuna sandwiches. But, you know what but, but the, what's in it? Honey mustard and cheddar cheese really sets it apart. That's good. You don't arrive at this size by not knowing what you fucking like. <laughs> <laughs> we thank these sandwiches for your wonderful physique, then. Yeah. All right. All right. That's really good. Well, on that note, I want to thank you for being part of the show. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really happy I met you, man. I am really That's happy. Same, man. I thank you for like holding me accountable. I appreciate that. I appreciate your honesty and your communication, man. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we um, out. I can put my sandwich on and smoke some weed now. <laughs> <laughs> you do that off camera. 
I'm hungry. Please do. That's hilarious, actually. It's like, we out, but my sandwich is not supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> we got to go. I'm hungry, and he's about to do some, uh, <laughs> something we don't want to see on camera. So thanks for watching. Peace. Peace.